Well, hello again, everybody. This is John Norris at Trading Perspectives. As always, we have our very good friend, Sam Clement. Sam, say hello. Hey, John. How are you doing? Man, I'm doing fantastically. It's a chilly but beautiful day here in Century, Alabama, and I've got no complaints. How about you? I cannot complain. It's been good. <laughs> it's, it's all good, and it's always all good. As a matter of fact, what I found good yesterday was our conversation that we had with local Federal Reserve uh, representative. And in our conversation that Sam and I had with him, a uh, great guy. I don't know how much he, uh, he, he should have told us, but he didn't tell us anything that we didn't already know uh, for all intents and purposes. Actually, Anouk was just asking us more questions about how we were viewing the economy. We got off talking on a tangent a little bit about supply chains and uh, about how the global pandemic undoubtedly has altered global supply chains to some regard. Because, you know, as we found, Sam, in February and March of earlier this year, saw a huge number of bottlenecks and just the delivery yeah. stuff around the world. And we still see them to a degree because uh, really a lot of manufacturers, not just here in the United States, but then also uh, around the world have just become way too reliant on China to be sort of the supply house for the, um, for the, for the global economy. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we have, I, anecdotally, I have spoken to some importers that said that even prior to the pandemic, uh, they were starting to diversify their supply chains away away from just China. And that was largely as a um, response to the tariffs that uh, President Trump was throwing at the Chinese. And, you know, Sam, you know, here we are now in December of 2020, and we've seen what happens when businesses rely too much on too few suppliers, particularly in, the, in, a very, in one geographic location. Do you think, really personally, that American business or global business is going to learn its lesson not to become too dependent on one supplier. Well, I, I think they are. I think I think they have to be. I think because you're seeing companies that are too dependent on one area, whether it's China or whether it's you know L.A. state of California that's being shut down currently, you know putting all your eggs in one basket has generally never been a good idea independent of what you're talking about. That's usually not a good idea. Um, and when it's a supply chain and when you're, you're, you're kind of, it's out of your control a little bit, you know, governor Newsom can go shut down the economy in California and that's 15% of our country's GDP and you can't really do anything about it. And, uh, you know, I, I think they've learned their lesson, whether it's by their own regard or whether they've seen other companies collapse that have not done this. Um, I think people are learning their lesson. And I think it's something we were probably seeing before, like you mentioned, with the tariffs and and um, just over the past couple of years, we've seen companies start to try and diversify away from any sort of company specific or any country specific risk. However, we're seeing that kind of be expedited. That's That's been one of the biggest trends is that we're seeing you know, a continued amount moving away from China or, or, or onshoring here in the United States, whatever it may be, we're just seeing that trend continue to accelerate. Well, you know, you're hitting a lot of heads on, you're hitting a lot of nails straight on the heads and you're absolutely right. And I would dare say that the average American consumer really doesn't appreciate just how much globalization and global supply chains matter and just day-to-day -day products. And that is what they kind of saw really in February, February, March, and even April of this year. All we had to do was shut down a couple of economies. And the next thing you know, gee whiz, we're doing without. And uh, it could be things yeah. as simple as uh, paper products, but that was more kind of outrageous demand, <laughs> demand here in the United States as opposed to anything else. But all of a sudden, you know, it got to be kind of frustrating for people that are used to have their stuff right at their beck and call to have to wait for a couple of weeks to get stuff from Amazon because they people yeah. just couldn't get their supplies from Southeast Asia. And some years ago, Sam, I read a uh, book called World War Z. You ever heard of it? World War Z by a guy named Max Brooks. I haven't read it, but I've heard of it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a zombie book. Uh, it's a, this guy, Max Brooks, has quite an imagination. His father is Mel Brooks. You've heard of Mel Brooks, Blazing Saddles and all that stuff. I have. And his mother oh, was yeah. Anne Bancroft, who happened to be Mrs. Robinson in The Graduate. So this guy's... Uh, 
a famous guy in and of his own self, but then he comes from even more famous parents. But one of the things that is, it's, if you haven't read the book, it's nothing like the movie with Brad Pitt. I would highly recommend the book if you just want a little escapism. It's dystopian fiction more than it is horror. In any event, um, you know, in the book, the narrator is having a conversation with a gentleman by the name of Arthur Sinclair, who had been the director of the U.S. government's uh, Department of Strategic Resources during the zombie apocalypse. And that was necessary because all of, uh, all of the economy's supply chain had gotten blown up because of zombies in the book. <laughs> That's, it wasn't the pandemic, it was the zombies. And, uh, and you know, this Arthur Sinclair guy, uh, you know, in the first interview with him said he swivelly and here it is straight from the book, he swivels in his chair, motioning, motioning, motioning to a picture above his desk. I lean closer and see that it's not a picture, but a framed label. Ingredients, molasses from the United States, anise from Spain, licorice from France, uh, vanilla and bourbon, bourbon vanilla from Madagascar, cinnamon from Sri Lanka, cloves from Indonesia, wintergreen from China, pimento berry oil from Jamaica, balsam oil from Peru. And that's just for a bottle of peacetime root beer. We're not even talking about something like a desktop PC or a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. So even little things uh, that we consume, you know, things like a, a bottle of root beer, which I haven't had a bottle of root beer and I don't know how long, it just requires global supply chains. And a lot of folks just don't understand it. Why, why can't I get my cotton swabs on time? Why can't I do this that, and the other thing? It's because American business has gone to those suppliers that have a comparative advantage over domestic ones. And, and you know, maybe China's got a comparative advantage over the Mexicans and what have you. And it's all looking to drive down unit labor costs, right? I mean, that's the reason why you do this, drive down your unit labor right. costs. But what yeah. good is having a, a low unit labor cost if you can't get your supplies? So, I mean, it's not good at all. <laughs> I mean, and that's what we're seeing is I think some companies are are starting to weigh weigh the benefits of you know shaving a few cents off their their marginal cost versus you know maybe having a more dependable supply chain. Yeah. Um, I think it just adds another layer to the decision. Well, and the thing is, I mean, and I've been speaking to some other business owners that are also importers, they said diversifying away from China and moving your operations to Vietnam really doesn't help as much as you might imagine, because guess what? Those suppliers in Vietnam are dependent on China. Right. And so, so you need to diversify not just away from China, not necessarily just away from Vietnam or what have you. If you want to have a global supply chain, it needs to be truly global. And the fact that it's got to be, it can't just be regional. You can't just have, okay, well, we're shipping from China to Vietnam because you still run into problems there. If you want to have a global supply chain, you have to make it, okay, you got some, some in Southeast Asia. You have some in um, Europe. You have some in Latin America. You have some in North some America. Here. You, have, you have some here in the United States. And not just within, and not just in the United States, as you're hitting, as you were alluding to, it's got to be within various states throughout the United States. Because yeah. what happens when you have someone as capricious as Gavin Newsom appears to be, or an Andrew Cuomo, or a Pritzker in Illinois, or uh, gosh, what's that woman's name out in uh, out, in, out in New Mexico? Uh, Bra- uh, Lujan. I don't know. Lujan is her is her is her maiden name. I can't remember what her or what what her uh, ma- married name is. But anyhow, she comes from a political family. Uh, Governor Murphy up in New Jersey. Here we have these states just adopting maybe some drastic measures to stem the, the flow of uh, the COVID-19 virus. And what happens if all of a sudden, hey, man, I'm a producer here in the great state of Alabama, Heart of Dixie and all that stuff. And I have diversified my supply chain away from China and Vietnam and by, by, by buying from suppliers in, in California. And Gavin Newsom decides he wants to shut down the entire state because he can. Well, then I'm I'm kind of SOL, aren't I? Well, I mean, some some of the states that are are doing this are some of the biggest producers in terms of you know total GDP to our country. I mean, you, you meant, mentioned Pritzker and Cuomo and Newsom, and you combine those three states, and that's that's close to thirty percent of our country's GDP. Um, I mean, that that's where a lot of this business and this growth comes from is is these largely populated cities. 
largely populated states and those are a lot of them are the ones being shut down the most right now and so um, you're just seeing companies continue to be hurt. I mean, they they onshore Erie State, and it's still not getting any better because some of those states are still shut down. Yeah, no, it's listen, it's uh, well, listen, we love some federalism here in here in the United States, and we have you know that's why we call it the United States of America, and arguably we have 50 sovereign states. However, within those 50 sovereign states we have some of them that are just more equal than others and california is one of them yeah and um new york is arguably one of them texas is one of them. uh florida new jersey mm -hmm. illinois uh really kind of the top five six seven you know state economies are huge and would be massive national economies throughout the entire world uh so is it fair or should it be allowed, should the central government allow in our federal system governors the power to effectively disrupt interstate commerce? I mean, that, that's a tough question. I, I mean, I don't know if they have that right in the first place um, to just kind of shut down their, their whole state. Um, but you know, there's just a fine line between balance of powers and what the state has the power to do. And generally, I, I tend to think that things that aren't written to be federal powers belong to the state. Well, listen, However, the federal government has used, been using the ICC to interstate commerce costs for a long time to cover yeah. all kinds of host of ills and evils. And I'm kind of surprised we're not saying to use it now. Yeah, so because I mean, we, we've got some governors that are really trying to throttle the U.S. economy, at least indirectly. But ultimately, that too, well, I would argue, is probably going to cause manufacturers and producers in states like Alabama, states like a Texas or a Tennessee or Arkansas or you name them, have to re-diversify their supply chains yet again away from just China, but then also away from these states that are, are locking down. And Sam, I think this is where we're going to see increased use of automation. And more importantly, I think we're going to see a lot of increase in usage of what is also known as additive manufacturing or 3D printing, where it'd be much easier for a lot and of local I, I producers to produce their own inputs. And I, I think another area is, is just consolidation. You know, if, you, if you're producing things in house, you know, you can kind of control it a little more instead of relying on somebody in California or, or somebody in China to produce something that you'll turn into something else. Hey, maybe let's, you know, consolidate vertically. Let, let's get a producer. Let's, let's get someone further down the supply chain or, you know, just have more control over it. You know, a, a bird in the hands worth two in the bush. And, you know, maybe it's worth, you know, sacrificing some earnings for a couple of years to go out and kind of consolidate your supply chain, bring stuff in house and and kind of de-risk your company's kind of portfolio. I think you're I think you're spot on. And I think hopefully that this will all teach us a valuable lesson. You know, simply going simply going to the exercise of driving down your unit labor costs as low as it possibly can in order to generate increased earnings. Yeah, that's great. That's what shareholder wants. But all of a sudden you have a bottleneck or you have a disruption in your supply chain. It really doesn't matter how low your unit labor costs are if you can't meet the meet the demands of your of your clients. Someone else is going well, to. Well, I think I, I think it's kind of like looking at, say, a stock and bond portfolio. I mean, historically, stocks outperform bonds, but that doesn't mean for everybody it makes complete sense to go out and push it out to 100% equities. There's risk involved with stocks, just like there's risk involved with, you know, these ways that companies are driving down their labor costs or their, their just marginal costs. Um, they're, you know, each penny they, they cut off, I mean, at some point it starts to add more and more risk whether it's, you know, country specific risk or, or what have you. But um, I, I think companies are faced with that reality and more more so now than they have been in the past that some of these some of these fears and some of these risks are real and can happen. So um, maybe maybe we'll see a shift kind of like we've seen uh, in, you know, the investment markets after pullbacks, people kind of readjust what their actual risk tolerance is. And um, maybe these companies will start to readjust their risk tolerance. Uh, 
Wow. Pretty insightful here today, Sam. I like it. I like it a lot. But I you're normally too. insightful. I make it sound like it's a kind of surprise. <laughs> I'm not surprised whatsoever. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're kind of taking this conversation we have, that we had with Anoop yesterday and just kind of exploding it. And, you know, I think we're both coming to the same conclusion that hopefully that this disruption that we've seen in 2020 uh, in the global economy will have some positive outcomes, at least positive outcomes in the fact that uh, producers, and I'm more concerned with domestic producers, will diversify their risk away from relying too, too much on the Chinese or Southeast Asia and will hopefully onshore some of their production, but more importantly, also vertically integrate and use, uh, use new, te new technologies and particularly additive manufacturing. And, and ultimately what we'll see is we won't be as dependent on China. We won't be as dependent on that. It's not necessarily a, a, a blow to globalism as much as a, as a victory for common sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And so, and so at the end of the day, what we might see for a short while are slightly higher unit labor costs, maybe some compression on margins for some companies, but we'll just use increased automation in order to get around some of those. And we'll see, um, you know, maybe the consumer and, you know, is going to have to deal with a slightly higher price or at least companies will try to pass it on along. But ultimately, at the end of the day, in three and five years' time frames, I do think that the U.S. economy will be less susceptible to global supply shocks uh, than it was clearly at the beginning of 2020, thanks to the global global economic shutdowns. And if that if that is the outcome, then as bad as 2020 has been, you know that's kind of a pretty big pretty big benefit that we've had from this this awful year. Yeah, just just like in 2008, there's some good that kind of came from tough times like that and, you know, lessons learned that hopefully will be used going forward. I think we'll kind of see some of that going forward with, uh, with all this. And sometimes, I, sometimes when I take a look at some of the stuff that's going on right now, I'm not sure whether or not we completely learned our lessons from 2008. We learned them for a few years and then all of a sudden we seem to be forgetting them. That's probably what's going to happen with this, you know, <laughs> but even, even so probably. With, with the technology that's out there, and with the ability that uh, companies will have moving forward to vertically integrate and produce their own inputs, I'm, I'm very excited about the future. And I, you know, just a very bad analogy, but I think a decent analogy nonetheless is, Sam, when I was growing up, I had very few choices for beer. Not that I was drinking a lot of beer when I was in elementary school. I wasn't drinking any of it, as a matter of fact. But in college, your beer selections were, um, between Budweiser products, Miller products, and maybe some Coors. That was it. As we went to the grocery store, that's what you had. Because really the state of Alabama didn't allow brewing. They, they mean, the Baptists were, were, no, we're not going to do it. Then all of a sudden, hey, gee whiz, we kind of loosened up on that. And take a look at uh, the number of, of uh, beer selections available just from our state. And take a look at the number of beer selections that we have yeah. at, at, at the grocery store. And these are all things that, you know, because we've loosened it up, because we looked outside the box, because we were willing to maybe spend a little bit more for a six pack of beer, ultimately consumers easily benefited from that. And the local economy has benefited from that by producing a lot of this product uh, locally, as opposed to having to get our Miller products from Albany, Georgia, and our, our Budweiser products from, uh, from St. Louis. So I'm excited about this. Ultimately, I think this is going to be good for the economy here in Alabama, which, I mean, this is my home. So I, I like it. I, th I do think that it's going to be bad. The more that Newsom, the more that Cuomo, the more that Murphy, the more that Pritzker, the more that Whitmer, the more that uh, Lujan, you know, people like that lock down their economies, the more that local economies in Texas and Tennessee producers in Alabama are going to start to bring a lot of their, uh, you know, supply chains in-house. I guess, if you will. So I, I, I completely agree. These governors are going to have to be <laughs> a lot smarter than to be in right now because long term yeah. businesses react. I agree. Man, I'm not sure if we traded any perspectives, and I'm not sure if anyone's from still listening after this. This is a little bit more economically driven than a, than a lot of what we've been talking about <laughs> recently. But, guys, I got to tell you, I mean, this has been a transformative year in the global economy. Uh, you know, and it's in the U.S. economy as well. And we're going to see businesses make a lot of changes based on what they have seen this year. 
and based on the disruptions that they've seen politically and then also economically. And ultimately, you're going to see a lot of domestic manufacturers become far more vertically integrated, use more technology, use even more automation, and we're going to be printing a lot more stuff, additive manufacturing or 3D printing, that has been, uh, it's always had a ton of potential. But we're really going to see that potential explode over the next several years as companies are looking to, you know, shore up their supply chains. Wow. Sam, what say you about that? I mean, that's all I got. <laughs> this is this is stuff only people that really love this stuff will like it today. My my parents undoubtedly have already turned this one off. So guys, <laughs> thank y'all so much for listening. We always love to hear from you. Also, if you uh, want to drop us a line, please do so at uh, train perspectives at oakworthcapital.com. You can always also go to our website, oakworthcapital.com, and take a look at what we have to say and how we think uh, by reading some of the articles underneath our thought leadership tab. There's a whole bunch of good stuff down there. And there are weekly newsletters and some of our serials, including the new normal, as well as the election projection. By all means, we invite you to go on out there and take a look at it. Sam, I'm going to give you a last shot. That's it for me. That's it for me today, too. Y'all take care.